Okay, uh, hello everybody, uh, and thank you for coming to this uh, event at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible, and uh, because we have a very exciting um, uh, topic today and an extraordinary guest. Uh, good afternoon and welcome here. My name is Vladimir Tismaniano. I'm a former Wilson, Wilson Center fellow and plenty of other associations in the past and probably in the future, I hope. And I'm currently a professor of politics at the University of Maryland and I direct the Center for the Study of Post-Communist Societies at the same place. It is my pleasure to host this presentation on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Global Europe and History and Public Policy Programs. And in as much as I know, the Canon Institute is also associated, although it was not on my uh, written uh, form here. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, all the programs that were involved, and uh, Christina for having put together this uh, event. Christian Osterman, who directs both programs that I mentioned, uh, the Global Europe and History and Public Policy. Uh, is currently away on travel and sends his most sincere apologies that he cannot be with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us to, to this very well-timed book discussion. We are on March 5th, needless to say, which uh, coincides with the 60th anniversary of Stalin's death. Uh, just anecdotally, uh, I published on uh, one of the uh, Romanian electronic uh, newspapers a fiction exercise uh, imagining how Ion Iliescu, who was at that moment a student at the Energetic Institute in Moscow, what happened in his soul at the moment when Stalin passed mm -hmm. away. And I received immediately uh, you know, a note from one of the forum uh, people who said, well, how about your parents? Why don't you do what they, was, what they were doing? I said, because I was only two at that moment, and I don't remember exactly what they were doing at that moment. But I can imagine where it came from, this type of comments. Okay. Uh, there are plenty of things to be said about that. Uh, uh, I would like to say that this is indeed an anniversary year, and as we advance in the next two, three, four years, we are going to have more and more anniversaries, uh, because we are getting closer and closer to the the big one, which would be in 2017. Uh, so it's going to be the centennial of the Bolshevik Revolution and all the things that changed in the world. I think that uh, what I will mark just a few of the moments, which are quite interesting from our perspective, and they are mentioned in uh, Professor Gelato's book. Uh, the, uh, after Stalin's death, immediately, the, uh, the Thaw, the publication of Ilya Ehrenburg's uh, novella, uh, and which gave the name to the period that was to follow, the new course in Hungary, and the new course, of course, in the Soviet Union, the arrest of Beria and the execution of Lavrenti Pavlovich, uh, the end of the Korean War, if I'm not wrong, 1953, and uh, it's a pity that he's not here, because he's one of the world's best uh, experts, uh, most knowledgeable experts on this. Of course, the Berlin Uprising in June 1953, Christian Osterman published a uh, book about that with the important, do very important documents. Now, about Robert Gelatelli, uh, uh, you know, when Christina said, I want to send you his uh, CV, I said, I think I know a lot about that. So, let me say first that uh, I was uh, enormously pleased a few years ago and was asked to review uh, his uh, book, The Age of Social Catastrophe, which I consider to be a classic of social science in its most uh, uh, admirable way that combines ethical uh, commitment and superb scholarship. Uh, the book was published uh, a few years ago, and it deals with uh, the three main dictators uh, that, in a way or another, established the, uh, the very uh, practice of totalitarianism uh, with its exterminist uh, consequences, the social catastrophe that Professor Gelati speaks about. Um, and uh, I would say another thing, which I think is very important for this author. So he's a professor, uh, R. Ray Beck, professor of history at Florida State University. His books have been published in, uh, and translated in different languages, over 20 uh, languages. Uh, we deal here with a uh, scholar who has uh, uh, focused on the two most atrocious experiences of the 20th century. Uh, his work bears upon the, what uh, a Polish intellectual once called the uh, twin 
dictatorship, the twin brothers, the twin totalitarianisms. And uh, he started uh, focusing primarily on the uh, on Nazi Germany. The, I mentioned here the book of 2001, backing Hitler, consent and coercion in Nazi Germany. The Gestapo in German society, enforcing racial policy, 1990. Uh, also, he published The Age of Social Catastrophe, and here we have a volume about which I'll say a few things later when my turn comes, uh, about uh, the Cold War, about Stalin and uh, Stalin's malediction, or as the title goes, uh, Stalin's curse, and uh, uh, very soon, uh, I won't be able to say more, but very soon, uh, one of these days, today or tomorrow, uh, some of my ideas about this would be uh, uh, published in an important British um, intellectual journal. Uh, so uh, I'll say a few things from uh, my own review. Uh, I would say, uh, if there is uh, uh, just the final, uh, the final point I want to make, I think that uh, my admiration for uh, Robert Gelato's uh, work is uh, is public, and as a matter of fact, it's one of the blurbs. I was very flattered to have it on the, uh, without being asked. It's from my critica. No, no, it's from my critica. Uh, public expression of, of admiration, and I was lucky enough to get a, a wonderful endorsement from Professor Gelato for my book, uh, The Devil in History. Uh, that came out at the end of 2012. This being, being said, I turn the microphone to our guest speaker and with the, what we discussed before, between 20 and 25 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate um, the time that you're spending with me and um, that um, you all look like very like um, distinguished colleagues and uh, experts in many fields and probably the masters and mistresses of any number of languages um, I don't even know. But let me just, um, I, have a, I have a paper I've tried to, I keep trying to shorten it. Um, I'll, I will, um, uh, Vladimir will um, um, bump me when I'm getting close and so I'll skip right to the end when I, that happens. But I thought I would just give you the, the, the paper as I have it now and we'll see, maybe I'll skip some things. I've already cut um, Churchill completely out. Poor, anyway, he'll be rolling in his grave and never mind. Um, but w let's, let's just go with what, we, with what I have. My interest in the Cold War has developed over many years. In fact, as I look back, I would say that it began around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s when I was still in high school. Over the years as a college student and then as a university professor, I looked more closely at the vast literature that had developed on the topic and examined the bitter controversies that had raged since 1945. In the process, I stumbled upon a number of very illuminating studies, but there was no one school of interpretation that I found completely satisfying. As with my other books, I wanted to find out for myself what really happened and what the Cold War was all about. So I plunged into the documents um, headfirst. Why did I end up focusing on Stalin? He turned out to be the key figure in the epicenter of events when the East-West conflict began. However, one might explain the motives behind his actions. It is clearly the case that his initiatives led to the Cold War. Moreover, by the time he died on March 5, 1953, exactly 60 years ago today, he had helped to create the communist world that seemed impervious to change as well as setting the terms of engagement with the West, and these configurations were all but frozen in place. Where to begin an account of this fateful turn of events? I found it is misleading at best to make a division, as we often do, between the end of the Second World War in May 1945 and the post-war period. Not only did the mayhem continue after VE Day, but massive violence in the name of the communist cause occurred simultaneously with the years of the conflict against Nazism and then spilled over into the post-war years. There were savage retributions, multiple ethnic cleansing operations, and civil wars, which became entangled in the establishment of new communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Similarly, in, Euro uh, in Asia, there's a seamless web of connections from the war against Japan 
to the Cold War. As far back as August 1939, the Soviet Union, as Hitler's ally, had begun to renew its mission, which had been on hold since the early 1920s, to extend the Communist Red Empire. According to Stalin, Hitler at war was unknowingly playing a revolutionary role by destroying old regimes and ruling classes. The Nazi invasion of the USSR in mid-1941, obviously, represented a dramatic setback for Stalin, but he still, even in the darkest days of the war, perceived opportunities for advancing the cause, even when the capitalist British and Americans came forward with offers of help. What is remarkable is that his faith in the inevitability of worldwide communist revolutions never wavered. He was the master of disguise. When he spoke with his accidental allies, he never used the language of the communist revolutionary, nor did he whisper of any aims for the post-war besides guarantees for the future security of the USSR. Who could possibly argue with that? Privately, however, Stalin never relented in his hatred for all the capitalist countries, be they German, Japanese, British, or American. His strong immediate preference was to milk the wartime alliance for all it was worth. Yet he was always prepared to go over to the offensive for the red cause or to encourage others to do so. As he put it succinctly to Yugoslav comrades in 1948, you strike when you can win and avoid the battle when you cannot. We will join the fight when conditions favor us, not when they favor the enemy. Historians and other observers have characterized Stalin in wildly varying ways. George Kennan, for example, famously pictured him as a czar who used communist ideology merely as a fig leaf to justify his tyrannical rule and territorial claims. Marxism-Leninism, Kennan told an audience in 1947, was a sort of mental eye or prism through which Soviet leaders viewed the outside. But rather than say how this mental eye might be related to Soviet actions and ambitions, Kennan concludes that the man in the Kremlin was little different from the czars. More recently, and with great popular success in Germany, Jürg Babarovsky points the spotlight on Stalin's murderous inclinations and labels him a psychopath who, like killing for its own sake, but whose violence was an end in itself and bore no relation to no, no relation to the man's ideology or motives. I disagree with these portraits. Although Stalin occasionally joked about being a czar, he was nothing like a traditional Russian statesman. In his various roles as ruler, intellectual pace setter, and the master of communist ideology, he carried forward a momentous social experiment unique in all of history. It was conducted with hundreds of millions of people in the nations that made up the Soviet Union. And beginning already in the midst of World War II, Stalin and his paladins, along with enthusiastic foreign disciples, disciples began extending the experiment into Eastern Europe and into Asia. They all shared the bond of their common Marxist-Leninist ideology, and an eschatological belief in world revolution. Beginning especially in the 1960s, American revisionists, influenced by the Vietnam War, accused the United States of being the main aggressor at the start of the Cold War as well. Although initially it was not my intention to challenge this theory and its many variations, my investigations led me to the point where I just had to acknowledge its many fallacies. The revisionists' explanation do not hold up most notably with regard to Stalin's aims 
the Roosevelt and Truman presidencies, dropping the atomic bomb, the Marshall Plan, the communist revolutions in Eastern Europe, the Berlin Crisis, the Korean War, and much more. The documents show, unlike the revisionists and others have said for so long, that Moscow made all the first moves and that, if anything, the West was either reactive or complacent until 1947 or 1948. Why the critical delay until the die was already cast? To begin with, President Roosevelt bent over backwards to ignore or downplay Stalin's methods of rule and obvious ambitions. FDR believed he could settle any problem in international affairs by gathering leaders for talks and then charm them into agreement. He was convinced he knew better than any of the experts what made the Kremlin tick and that he could work wonders in Europe or in the Middle East for that matter. Soviet statesmen saw matters differently. For them, FDR's efforts to be friendly, informal, or accommodating were taken as signs of weakness and corruption, and they were quick to exploit his sympathies. Churchill uh, was wo woefully wrong as well in everything practically that he did with the Soviet Union in the wartime period. I set that aside. I found Truman to be a far better president than do many historians, and by no means a determined cold warrior from the start. He was hesitant and uncertain, but honest and prepared to deal openly with the Soviets. My book is by no means entirely about international affairs, armed conflict, and mass murder. I like to think of myself as a social historian. Thus, while my focus is on the developments leading into the Cold War, I pay particular attention to post-war Soviet society. For that was where Stalin and his comrades first revealed what would become their post-war stance. Most Soviet citizens who hoped for more freedom in return for their wartime sacrifices were in for a grave disappointment. Before the, sh the shooting stopped, Stalin set out to shore up his dictatorship and to straighten out the ideological wanderings that had crept into communist theory. Those nations within the USSR who had revealed themselves in some sense as enemies during the war were punished in typically Stalinist style. The Kremlin boss egged on those like Andrei Zhidanov who cut Soviet intellectual ties to the West. It was as if they were preparing the home front for the war of ideas and political principles that he was determined to pursue against the West. The image of the man and his rule in the last years of his life that comes across in my book is strikingly different from the one offered in a recent account where, by contrast, the Soviet dictator is said to have presided over a process of post-war domestic reform, an astonishing statement. In 1944 or 1945, the Kremlin boss was too shrewd to believe that the Red Army could simply occupy countries to the West and then openly hoist communist leaders into Soviet-style dictatorships. That would have set off alarm bells in Britain and the United States, from whom he wanted loans, not hostility. Therefore, and on his express orders, native communists were to create national French coalition governments. This strategy was followed all over Eastern and Central Europe, and Stalin wanted it used everywhere in Asia, too. For the Kremlin boss, however, this was strictly a transitional stage to quiet the fears of his Western allies as well as local populations. Stalin then put his personal stamp on the system of rule he exported, and once his foreign disciples were in place, they convinced themselves that his was the winning brand and covering everything they could. Even the independent-minded Yugoslavs at first insisted, insisted 
on being instructed by advisors of all kinds from Moscow. They and the others willingly went. In fact, like Mao Zedong, they begged to pay homage to the master and to seek advice or patronage or to indulge themselves on plush vacations near him as often as he permitted. They all believed their country could find its own special path to socialism in the universal brotherhood of the promised Red Empire. What links would there be between Moscow and the newer communist countries? This was not decided in advance. The disciples, however, fell over themselves anticipating what was expected, while he, Stalin, <coughs> responded to circumstances and changed the party line as he saw fit. Eventually, he decided to enforce conformity under his thumb on East European countries just as he did on his own people. It would be hard to imagine another outcome. The immediate challenge for all these regimes in 1944-45 was the devastation and misery left from the Second World War. In addition, they had to confront the stark fact that the majority of people in Europe wanted nothing to do with communism. Nevertheless, and well before the dust settled, Stalin and his paladins had managed to create communist police states on the Soviet model. The boss exercised a profound influence, far more hands-on than often supposed. As it happened, how are we doing? As it happened in 1944-45, and even later, there were more opportunities to build the Red Empire than Stalin thought it prudent to exploit. True to form and convinced of the wisdom of his advance and retreat, retreat tactics, the self-proclaimed revolutionary ended up trying to restrain ardent worshipers in places like Iran, Greece, Yugoslavia, Korea, and China. Not because he wanted to discourage the communists, but because he judged the situation as premature. He did the same in the case of France and Italy, where an unusually favorable alignment of forces existed at war's end. Washington was a reluctant warrior in post-war Europe, and its first major step, at least the first one taken seriously, came in 1947 in the form of the Marshall Plan. This funding was designed to overcome the post-war social crisis that was spiraling out of control and causing such misery. The money was also made available to the Soviet Union and those in its sphere of influence, but Stalin rejected it notwithstanding the catastrophic situation in his own country and all of Eastern Europe. As I maintain in the book, confronted with the offer of American aid, he was forced into a corner largely of his own ideological making. Why should the Soviet leader not concede that the war had been much worse than he first led on? Why not remind the West of the bitter truth that the Soviets had paid with infinitely more blood than anyone else for the victory over Hitler? Why not? Millions upon millions of its citizens had been killed and the country was in ruins. Why not ask for help? Because it did not fit the Kremlin plans for the future. Stalin's priority was for the communist transformation of Europe and the world. The Marshall Plan offered him a choice between those aims versus the impoverishment of millions. He opted for his political mission and refused American aid. Those who condemn the United States, let me say, for offering the Marshall Plan aid would condemn it far more, as I certainly would, if it had done nothing to end the suffering and starvation in Europe at that time. We would be right to blame the United States, by far the richest nation on the globe, if it had turned away from the desperate and worsening situation in Europe. Stalin, it was, who had the power in his hands 
to stop the drift into the Cold War. He had many other choices as well that I outline in the book. The all-powerful Stalin had no worries about objections or opposition back home. The hindrances stopping him were entirely of his own creation. At any rate, he condemned the people of communist countries to generations of shortages, retarded growth, and dictatorial rule. Brief word of conclusion. The story that unfolded between the beginning of the Second World War and Stalin's death in 1953 is gripping and monumentally tragic. These were the foundation years for what became the Red Empire. <clears throat> Once in place, and in spite of chronic deprivations, it looked to be an impregnable fortress. Most ordinary people adjusted to the inevitable. Until then, unexpectedly, time ran out on the great social experiment. Unimaginably, who here would have thought it? The Berlin Wall dissolved into dust in 1989. The mighty Soviet Union itself ceased to exist in 1991. Although all these communist countries bristled with armies, and although the secret police forces were larger and could see more than ever, they barely fired a shot. It was as if there was nothing left to defend. The struggle, as we know, between the anti-Stalinists and the Stalinists is still on in Russia, and to a greater or lesser extent also in the former republics and satellite countries. Given the trends in the world, it is likely that the anti-Stalinists will prevail. We need to keep in mind that it took the communists many decades to dig themselves and their people into a hole. It is going to take time, energy, and determination to get out of it. Even now, there are signs that the worst may already be behind them, and there may be grounds for hope that they will ultimately triumph over Stalin's curse. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, a superb uh, sum, a synthesis of the main ideas of the book. And uh, I'll make a few comments. Listening very carefully to Professor Gelatelli's presentation, uh, I think there are three elements that uh, need to be kept in mind regarding Stalin's philosophy. Uh, or Stalin's worldview. I know Steve Kotkin is writing now a book about Stalin's Weltanschauung, and uh, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, Eric Van Ray's book about Stalin's political thought is also comes to mind. Communism for Stalin had three components, uh, and they are absolutely fundamental to understand uh, the Vosges mind. Uh, communism was irreversible. Uh, the, the order doesn't matter. Irreversible, invincible, and inevitable. These were three elements that uh, presided over Stalin's international philosophy or international relations philosophy, and I think this emerges very clearly from Professor Gelateri's book. I'll make a few comments, and then the floor is going to be open for uh, questions and comments. Uh, I think that this is, an, as I said before, it's an outstanding work. Using an enormous amount of information in numerous languages, Robert Gelatelli highlights Stalin's geopolitical designs and demonstrates against revisionist historical claims that it was the Soviet Union, not the United States and her ally, allies, that wanted and provoked the Cold War. This is particularly important now when historical ignorance and poor scholarship meet in attempts to present a dangerously naive American politician like Roosevelt's former Vice President Harry Wallace as a visionary statesman. Uh, some of you may have read what Ron Radosh has published and what Sean Williams has published recently in the New York Review of Books, so I think this has to be emphasized. The book cannot come at a better moment, okay, from some perspective. 
and a worse moment for other perspective. <laughs> okay, uh, a prominent historian of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, Robert Gelatili, offers a panoramic view of Stalin's political, diplomatic, and psychological maneuvers that allowed the Soviet Union to achieve superpower status. The author has an encyclopedic knowledge of his subject and provides a compelling narrative of ruse, brutality, foolishness, and betrayed idealism. The story evolves chronologically from Stalin's triumph against his rivals within the Bolshevik elite in the aftermath of Lenin's death through the horrors of the Great Terror, the Pactus Hitler, the early disasters that followed the Nazi attack in June 41, and the rise of the anti-fascist coalition. Gelatinly rightly emphasizes Stalin's obsessive fixation on internal enemies as well as his dedication to the purity of the official doctrine. Stalinism was first and foremost an ideocratic system. Stalin was not simply an autocrat, he was an ideocrat. If we don't take this into account, I think we are missing the thrust of the story. We talk about another story, okay? But not the one that this book is about. Uh, the chapters dealing with the summits in Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam are truly illuminating, in my view, adding important nuances to previous interpretation of those world historical events. Gelatil's view of the Soviet international goals differs significantly, as he mentioned here, from the classic formulation issued by George Kennan in the 40s. Whereas Stalin embraced great Russian imperial goals, this was not a mere return to Romanov's geopolitical, the Romanov dynasty geopolitical dreams. Stalin, as this book emphasizes, was a Leninist internationalist, and this book is a testament to how this messianic agenda came to be carried out in the aftermath of World War II, not only in Europe, but in Asia as well. The master of the Kremlin knew how to cover his design, simulating a benevolent, self-restrained behavior. Yet he approved of, as this book emphasizes, and encouraged Kim Il-sung to attack the South and embark on a military adventure with fa fateful consequences. The difference between Stalin and his arch-rival Leon Trotsky amounted to a different view of the communist, of the pace of the communist expansion, not in the legitimacy of such a strategy. This is indeed the most disturbing point that revisionists need to come to terms with. Had the despot not passed away, he was fully intent upon provoking and fighting a new world war, which he was convinced he and the progressive camp could win. We have now documents about that. The meeting in Moscow that you mentioned at the, in 1952 of the first secretaries and defense ministers and so on. The concentration of troops at the Romanian Yugoslav border that we have plenty of documents at this moment. Basically, it shows that the intention was there. In this respect, I would argue Mao, with his metaphor that the winds from the east would prevail over the winds from the west, was truly faithful to Stalin's testament. Khrushchev, the champion of peaceful coexistence, was in fact the revisionist renegade Mao so furiously denounced. I'll finish in a second. The instrument Stalin created to pursue his ultimate revolutionary project, an instrument that still needs historical analysis. We don't have a history of the coming form comparable to the great histories of the coming turn. Obviously, the coming form never achieved the same institutional dignity and development as the coming turn. It lasted much less. It was not a global institution and so on. At the same time, uh, okay, so the coming form, an abbreviation for the Information Bureau of the Communist and Workers' Party, found in October 47 during a secret conference in Poland. It is important to keep in mind that Stalin, during the creation of the coming form, this is part of the documents that I consulted, and some of them are available in Norman Neymar's writings and other people's writings. Stalin used a conspiratorial strategy for all those years. He was writing letters, telegrams, to the leaders of the communist parties in East Central Europe, to the little Stalins, Rakoshi, Georgi, Udej, and company, and so on. And to Zdanov and Malenkov, for instance, when they were in Slaska Poremba for the founding of the coming form, and they were signing with pseudonyms. Stalin was Filipov and so on and so forth. Why pseudonyms in ultra secret telegrams? I mean, what? This is the war mentality that dominated fundamentally and the who, whom, Ktokavo mentality that was so important. Stalin himself baptized it the official weekly of the coming form for a lasting peace for people's democracy. That was, and asked, this is a chapter actually mentioned even by Solzhenitsyn in the first circle, okay, when he asked, why do you have this is an impossible name? Imagine somebody going to a kiosk and saying, can I have a copy for a, la from a, for a lasting peace for people's democracy. <laughs> and Stalin's answer was very good for a propagandist to this. Uh, let each time the imperialist press quotes our publication, let them also quote our slogans. For a so in an article published in For a Lasting Peace for People's Democracy, X wrote, 
okay, in the New York Times. And they will find it. That's exactly what happened. So it was, uh, propagandistically speaking, a very astute uh, move. Each word in this title was a lie. The peace was not meant to be lasting, and the uh, democracy was not at all people's. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of the late Boris Varin, who used to say, USSR for letter for, why, for lies. Okay, so uh, the journal's first headquarters was in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, then after the break with Tito, it moved to Bucharest, Romania. The avatars of the coming form, Tito's excommunication, the show trial, so uh, uh, masterfully described in this book and analyzed, deserve, in my view, a full discussion. Stalin and his chief, uh, chief ideologue, Andrej Danov, designed it as a select group, not including major parties, and this is a key problem. Why the Chinese or the Greek ones? Let me conclude. In 1952, that's important. Robert Gelatelli says Stalin was an ideologue. Stalin was a philosopher. This sounds a little bit uh, surprising. Yes, Stalin was a philosopher. He was a relatively cultivated man in the, in the field of Marxist, in Marxology, and so on and so forth. In 1952, we know this from the memoirs published in the Yale series that you published, the book about Spain Betrayed, uh, by Dmitry Shipilov. Shipilov was the editor-in-chief of Pravda, and as the title of the book is Kremlin Scholar, the Kremlin Scholar, okay? Dmitry Shipilov, in his uh, memoirs, describes the last month of Stalin's life. The man was true truly obsessed with the text. They were writing at that moment a handbook of political economy of socialism. Uh, hours and hours of discussion on the issues of political economy of socialism. So he spent most of his time in discussions related to a treatise on socialist economy, maniacally editing texts provided by his most trustworthy sycophants. Uh, I remember he at this very uh, Wilson Center years ago when Jonathan Brent presented his wonderful book about uh, Stal inside Stalin's archives, and he said that he worked on Stalin's edited uh, texts, and he said, I wish I had such editors at Yale University Press. The man was truly a maniacal editor, okay? It took a few weeks after his death for his successor to start de-Stalinizing the country. Now, as a tribute to Robert C. Tucker, let me say, de-Stalinization, Tucker wrote, uh, did not start with the secret speech in 1956. And that's an important lesson about charismatic dictators in our times. De-Stalinization, Tucker wrote in the Soviet political mind, started on March 5th, 1953, with the death of the dictator. That's basically the key Key, in a way, a key lesson. This is not, however, a revolutionary break with Stalin's delusion, but rather an attempt to give the most irrational features of the dictatorship uh, a less obnoxious uh, image. In the long run, for the next decades, Gelatli correctly argues and concludes his book, quote, Soviet leaders and ruling elites continue to articulate their positions very much along the lines he said, until the whole edifice of the once mighty Red Empire came came crashing down. With this uh, comments, the floor is now open for questions. This session being, video, being videotaped, uh, video recorded, uh, I ask you please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and before you ask your question, please state your name and affiliation. Can I just, say, make, just make one brief comment before, uh, I promise just one. Um, um, I, uh, I should say very often that I didn't set out with a political agenda. Um, I, I was not trying to appeal to any po political persuasion. Um, that I was not um, in, you know, I didn't know that much about um, revisionists and, and the kind of mischief they were up to. I hope there are no revisionists here that I'm offending horribly. Um, but in any case, um, I came to this with a fresh view. I, I wanted to let the documents. Uh, um, read the documents uh, and, and find the truth as best I could. And I, I had no uh, prior commitment to uh, one side or the other, whether the Marshall Plan was a good thing, bad, or otherwise. So I just uh, read the documents, looked at the material, and, let, uh, and tried to get at the truth as best I could. And I had no idea that Stalin spent so much time on this text in particular um, that he was writing. But this was uh, going to be a text. And he had, uh, I give an exact number of times, but he, he asked for something like 10 or uh, 15 different revisions. At one stage, the entire Central Committee, um, and um, I think the Politburo, were, they were all working on it. Uh, there's no, doc no document in the history of man, um, uh, ne never mind uh, the Soviet Union, has been looked at by so many p political figures. But this was to be the document, you see. This was to be the document that combined a theoretical combination that outdid, that, that, was, uh, that was better than Marx, that outdid Marx. It was going to be the, the text. And he, wanted to, he insisted that this had to be scientific. 
and therefore ha it had to show scientifically why the kulaks uh, and others, why, why, why people embraced uh, the, the collective farms, why scientifically, why they had to do all these things. And of course, uh, he was sending Mission Impossible. How could you write a scientific text proving that people wanted to live on collective farms? So uh, no wonder he needed so many revisions. Richard Kitterman, a uh, former Kennan Institute intern. You mentioned earlier uh, something about how Churchill had not got Stalin right either, and I was under the impression that Churchill was much more critical of Stalin than Roosevelt was, and like Churchill's famous speech about how he'd make a fable reference to the devil in Parliament if Hitler invaded hell, so uh, I was wondering uh, what what You'd, what you'd say about uh, Churchill well, miscalculating Stalin. Yeah. I'd like, I think it would probably be better if I can just try to, I'll try to finish these, these, these quickly as I can. Um, uh, it was great with, great with great reluctance that I had to pick on Churchill too. I didn't want to. Um, um, but the fact is that he, uh, uh, once, uh, the, the, once under attack by, the, uh, by Hitler, um, um, of course he was desperate for allies. Um, the Soviet Union was under attack after June 41, and they became allies. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, Churchill um, uh, came to believe uh, wrongly, quite wrongly, um, that he could be, um, that Stalin could be trusted. That's what he said, that he could be trusted. When anything uh, that Churchill considered despicable happened, for example, uh, when the Soviet Union refused, uh, the Red Army refused to aid the Polish uh, uprising in August 1944, when things like that happened and uh, the Red Army stood idly by on the other side of the Vistula River, um, uh, Churchill then attributed these decisions to unknown dark forces um, inside the Kremlin who were evidently stronger than this nice Uncle Joe. Um, and I'm afraid um, uh, then to talk, that was in, in August, if that wasn't bad enough, in October 1944, he followed, uh, Churchill followed that up by going to Moscow on his own um, and offering uh, the Soviet dictator, uh, I'm sure to his great surprise and even bewilderment, that uh, here, why don't you have all of the, the better part of Eastern Europe? And he worked out this so-called percentages deal, as you'll, as you'll know. And the percentages deal, some historians like to say this, this didn't matter, it was, it was all this or all that or the other thing. The fact is that the Soviet unions took it extremely seriously. And as a matter of fact, very next day, Molotov was hounding hounding uh, the, the, the British secretary um, to uh, up the percentages and got them upped. And so those percentages, th that was as good as conceding Eastern Europe uh, to, um, to the Soviet Union. And uh, what that amounts to is, although in the 30s and from a long time, even from 1917, uh, Churchill hated communism, and in the 30s he hated even perhaps just as mo much or more, he hated um, um, uh, the appeasers, uh, he found them completely despicable, and yet, by 1944, I'm afraid to say that uh, Churchill's own behavior uh, came to be remarkably similar to appeasing Stalin, except this time it was uh, Stalin who was being appeased and not Hitler. And it, it's with reluctance that I have concluded that. I didn't set out to, to, to put black marks against Churchill's name or anybody else's name. Thank you. Uh, Dave Rogers, independent uh, scholar. Uh, I was in uh, graduate school in the 60s, so I very much remember the uh, Cold War revisionist controversy. But I'm curious, were they, are they, I've been out of the groves of academe for a lot of years, so I'm curious if this thought, if this uh, point of view is still prominent uh, among diplomatic historians. Did it just, one of these strange things like Pearl Harbor revisionism just come and go? Or is there any, uh, uh, or is there any any, any strong, f still strong feelings on this in favor of this uh, theory anymore? I don't teach uh, I don't teach American diplomatic history, but um, and so I'm not an expert on what they're teaching in in, in schools, um, except uh, at, at universities, except uh, books like Walter Lefevre and others like that. And Walter Lefevre was a close, uh, um, um, uh, had a close ties with um, uh, William uh, Appleby Williams, Appleman Williams, um, um, and 
uh, what happens is that what I think has happened is that revisionism has taken on uh, varying forms, but it always seems to come back to it, 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 it. There are many colorations of it, and I'm not suggesting that it's it, it exists today the way it was taught in the 60s, but under varying forms, it continues. And of course, the 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 issue is sometimes uh, not as straightforward as it once was. But for for example, uh, pertains to uh, launching of the the atomic bomb and uh, whether the bomb was necessary, um, or uh, whether uh, tr whether Truman was um, uh, carrying out in quotes atomic diplomacy at Potsdam. Um, I have a lot to say about what happened at Potsdam, uh, and, and and the interrelationships between the the characters who were there and the timing of the of the first bomb and the second bomb and the Soviet declaration of war in, in, the, in the middle of that, one, two, three, and how Stalin um, um, had, it, had it in his power at that moment when, when, tr when, when, uh, when they were standing there together, Truman said, you know, um, we have this, this new in, incredible weapon. And um, uh, Stalin just looked at him and, and turned and, and walked away. And, Churchill rushed over and said, well, what, what, did he, what did he say? And Truman said, um, he didn't ask me anything. And I've always thought to myself, and I, uh, you know, I just think to myself out loud, why not ask? Well, if not then, maybe a day later when you thought about it a bit more, or two days later when you thought about it a bit more, why not come clean? Why not say, listen, you know, I said, whatever I said, there were seven million people killed in the Soviet Union. It's not true. Three or four times that many people have been killed. We are in desperate condition, but we were the allies, and we, we, we paid with blood unlike, you know, 10 times more, 50 times more than your country did. And we demand now that, uh, you know, this, this, this can't go on, and we, we want to know all the secrets about the atomic weapon, and let's stop this craziness right now. Why don't we stop this arms race that we both know uh, is on the horizon? Why don't we stop it right now? It's in our power. But instead of that, Stalin turns and walks away. And I always like to think that there are these opportunities that come up, there are turning points in history. And this was potentially a major turning point that could have stopped the craziness of the, of the, of the, of the arms race. And um, it, it, what happens when you, when, you, when you look at revisionist accounts, and these accounts are of that particular decision are right there, right up to today, it's being debated you know, even, even as we sit here, for example, that one is still going on. Um, what, what happens is the, the onus, the, the, the belief, the, the bad faith is always, is always um, uh, thrust uh, to Truman and to some extent Churchill on that day. And um, I'm not accusing anybody of bad faith, but uh, a statesman on that moment, a statesman at that moment, especially a country that had suffered as much as the Soviet Union had, I think it was an enormous lost opportunity, a world a historical lost moment. And um, the Soviet Union paid for this more than anybody else, actually, uh, in terms of uh, um, generations of impoverishment that it thrust upon its own people. And what a shame it was. Uh, maybe I'm being naive and thinking, look, you know, why can't statesmen just hit the table and get angry and say, damn it all, you know, we've all suffered too much, our people more than anybody. We've tried this social experiment. Maybe we can conduct it another time, but right now we have to get over this. We are in, you know, the Soviet Union in 1945, at the, mom at the moment in Potsdam, the Soviet Union is on the verge of uh, a famine. If a famine is just around the corner, a famine in the Soviet Union that causes a million deaths, excess uh, uh, deaths. And as someone who really cared about their people, someone who wanted to put the uh, the improvement of their people in the here and now before this, this, this final, final goal that was somewhere over the horizon, they would have said, Mr. Truman, I don't know what this weapon is and maybe you don't know, uh, but let's do something. And what would Truman have said? Truman himself didn't know. He had no idea. Truman was an honest man. When he, the first thing he said when he got to Potsdam, he wrote his wife after an informal meeting, the first meeting with, 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 with uh, Stalin. And he said, you know, uh, I, like, I like him. He's, he's smart as hell. But he told me uh, that he's ready to go to war with us uh, uh, in Japan. And that's all I really came for. So, you know, God bless him. And then there. Uh, yes. Uh, as uh, both uh, 
Bob and Vladimir know. Ron uh, Radosh. Yeah, Ron Radosh, uh, Hudson Institute. Uh, I've been on what still is, uh, although Sean Willens has now joined me on this one-man campaign against Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick's uh, uh, book and TV series. And I think we can't underestimate the uh, how many people that has reached and miseducated a whole new generation. Their book was on the New York Times bestseller list, at least for one or two weeks. Uh, the TV series, I, do, I have not read any reports of how many people have viewed it, but for the past four months, every weekend, they appear in the major campuses in our country before thousands of students, where they show excerpts from the film and then speak. They, as a point of principle, they refuse to engage in any debate or dialogue with historians or scholars who have a different point of view. Uh, they simply ignore, as Sean Williams showed so powerfully in his New York Review piece, they ignore any scholarship, any work that contradicts their assertions. And what's most shocking is not, Oliver Stone is not a historian, but Peter Kuznick is. He wrote, actually, the book and the script. Uh, you look in the blurbs from prominent, eminent historians in our country, like Marty Sherwin, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Oppenheimer. They are endorsing that series and giving it their imprimatur and their back backing. And uh, they are going to reach 90, I hate to say this, but they're going to reach 90% more people than your book. I wish well, not book. Not, maybe, hold on now, maybe, don't, don't, don't sell this book short. No, uh, no, no, I, um, I wish you could get this, uh, let, I mean, it's up to you guys here. You'll have to get the word out about that. Right, I mean, I, no. I mean, I, but the point is, that's, you see, sir, that, this, these are the revisionists, you see, that, that we're talking about. I think revisionism, Cold War revisionism, whatever they call it now, it's not dead. They are still there. They, are, they write as if nothing has been learned, as if the works of John Gaddis haven't come out. Uh, uh, the book by Wilson Miss Campbell hasn't come out, which actually your book actually confer confirms much of what he did. Yours is much more readable and narrative, but his is also brilliant and extremely perceptive on the changes in Truman's policy. He, he makes the same point you make, that Truman came into it trying to fulfill FDR's policy. His first group of advisors were all very friendly to Stalin, very friendly to the Soviets, and then as time passed, he began to see this isn't working, moved to other advisors who had a different point of view. But uh, the thing about the Cold War revisionists, they haven't changed the argument. The one point I made, and I'll stop talking, is that uh, when I wrote my piece in the Weekly Standard on the Stone and Kuznick thing, what I discovered is that almost verbatim, they repeat the arguments with the exact same quotes in the exact same order as a book written in 1952, an American book written by a communist who was in the OSS, a late communist named Karl Marzani, who was subsidized by the KGB, which published his book in the United States. And they repeat, it's almost the exact same argument. If you get that book, which is still being sold in Amazon, it was actually reissued in the 1970s with an introduction by Barton Bernstein of Stanford University in a new edition, and he rightfully called it the first Cold War revisionist book, but they haven't come beyond what was written 50 years ago. The same argument, the same quotes, out of context, the same uh, forced argument that isn't really history, but just polemic. And uh, that, to me, is astounding. Uh, it says something, like, I don't know what it says, about the failure of m many historians eminent members of the profession who don't and can't or won't look at evidence. To me, that is really shocking. There was a question there. Yeah, this oh, OK, the gentleman. Um, to what extent, now, madness, uh, Stephen Shore, madness and method are not necessarily irreconcilable. And you've pointed out that has, as a communist ideologue, Stalin took positions that were almost incontrovertibly against the interest of his own nation. But to what extent was the madness in his mind, and when did it first enter? Um, well, um, you know, uh, I'm not a, a psychiatrist, um, and uh, I'm certainly aware 
um, of the frequent um, uh, allegations about Stalin's mental health, and particularly ones that are circulated uh, by a, a very uh, a good German historian, Jörg uh, Babarovsky, who happens to be a friend of mine. I don't know how friendly we're going to remain. Um, but he thinks that uh, Stalin was a psychopathic killer. Well, you see, the thing is, if you really look at what a psychopath is, um, uh, and you look at the, the, the medical, uh, uh, what the background of it is, uh, half the people in this room would qualify as uh, psychopaths. Um, probably I'm a psychopath, I don't know. Um, uh, but the thing is that um, uh, um, um, I think it's, uh, um, I, I find it always, um, uh, unsatisfying when people say that St Stalin was, for example, let's use another one that's used m even more, Stalin was paranoid. Well, if Stalin was paranoid, um, it, where, where was his paranoia when he needed, needed it most in June 1941? I mean, um, he was, he was, he was in, in, you know, flooded with information from, I mean, uh, we, we can even document how many pieces of legitimate information. I mean, it was like 50 different hot at tips. There were very good tips from the beginning, and they got hotter. And yet, um, in spite of the uh, this uh, this um, uh, flood of information, Stalin kept on saying no. So the question is, why? Why did he say no? And I'll tell you why. He said no because he had a materialist conception of history, and his view of Nazism was that uh, Nazism was basically uh, the running dog of the capitalists. And what do capitalists, imperialist dogs, want? They want treasure and booty, oil and wealth. So if we, the Soviet Union, appease Hitler, yes, appease Hitler by giving him absolutely everything they need, there will be no material reason for the Nazis to attack the Soviet Union. What he failed to understand, he also failed to understand Nazism fundamentally, but what he failed to understand about Hitler was that, um, that Hitler was not driven just by material considerations, but by ideological ones. And his ide uh, ideological interest in co the conquest of the Soviet Union overrode the material ones. And so uh, here you have this, um, here you have a, a person who is, uh, I think madness is too easy a, r a way out for us when we can't find an explanation for something. We say, oh, he, he was mad, I, I'm mad. Or why would he repeat Napoleon's mistake or something like that about Hitler? And I think that is um, um, a, a, a phony way, really, well, a, a, a lazy way around uh, difficult questions. One last question, yes. Well. Uh, Will Pomeranz, Kennan Institute. You talked about Stalin as the ideologist and then working on theory and ideas and so forth, but what's interesting is that in 1917 he really wasn't a theoretician. He was kind of received as someone kind of was involved in the bureaucracy of it, and that's how he rose, but he wasn't seen as being the intellectual heavyweight within the Bolshevik party. So to what extent does this interest in ideology and all these kind of interests and ideas, is it is an attempt to kind of prove to people that he was actually much smarter than people perceived that he was? Uh, to what extent does he really have a chip on his shoulder as he pr approaches all these uh, questions of ideology? Well, you know, as all of you can see, um, the, a book like the one I've written, I actually traced this particular thing, and I wanted to find out many other things about Stalin. I could have, this book could have been uh, two or three volumes easily, but I refused to, I just wanted to do it in one volume. But I wanted to find out, I wanted to trace, if I could, Stalin's intellectual development, and I just tried to pin it down a little bit. And I think Stalin's moment of conversion was when he was in Siberia, and Lenin wrote him a letter to a comrade uh, in, in 1902, and he got it in 1903. And if you look at the letter to a comrade by, from Lenin to Stalin, it's not actually to Stalin. Uh, he, he, uh, Stalin always felt it was really to him. But from that moment on, I think, Stalin was converted to, uh, to, to the communist faith. Of course, he, he had no education. He, he was a self-educated man, as many leaders were. And I tried to trace this out. First thing I wanted to find, I, there are many questions I want to find out. The next one I want to find out is, it's one thing to believe in ideas, but when, is, when does he first order somebody to be killed for them? I wanted to see if I could figure that out. And I, I traced it to his time in Tsaritsyn in 1918. He was there as a, um, you know, a messenger uh, on a mission for Lenin. And it was then that he, I think, issued the first order for people to be executed. 
And in the 1920s, the significance of that city must have hit some kind of chord among him and his, his comrades because they suggested that that city be renamed. Not a city in Georgia, not a city in Siberia, where he spent lots of time too, but that city to be renamed as Stalingrad. And that's, that, that was significant to me. And I, traced, I try to trace this out, but um, Eric, uh, Eric Van Rie has done a, you know, a, a tremendous book on, on Stalin's intellectual development. Uh, he, he's a wonderful, he's the Dutch scholar, writes it in English. Um, he, he's, it's a fantastic book. I think Stalin gradually became, you know, he read, he read voraciously. He marked up all his books. Um, you know, you, I mean, Eric, Eric Van Rie is one of these humble people. He said, in writing his book on Stalin's intellectual development, he descended into, into these books and all that material, and he never thought he'd ever make it back out. But I'll tell you, uh, from already in the 1930s, Stalin is planned, you know, he wrote these little books um, uh, uh, the short, on the short course, an immensely, immensely influential book. People took from that Marxism so much more difficult to read, uh, uh, but people all around the world, revolutionaries, read those books and took things from them, Mao and uh, uh, all the uh, Asian communists as well. And uh, he already in the 30s set out to do his magnum opus, one on economics. This was going to be one on economics, one for, one for the little people, you know, the simple book, and a, a bigger one. Eventually, he went through 10 or 15 drafts, this thing being drafted and redrafted and redrafted. And toward the end of his life, this, I mean, after 1945, he, he still determined to produce this magnum opus. And when he... Even, you know, we think of him in the post-war period as, a, as aged and infirm and uh, declining, and that's the sort of image that one gets of him, and perhaps he was. But when he, when he talked about any issues, when he had in the people about movies, for example, with Zhdanov, mo about the movies, movie directors, or the poets, these kind of people in the, in, in the so-called Zhdanov era, era, which is really actually pushed always by Stalin, they were always astounded, astounded at his brilliance. And um, um, uh, who am I to say um, that he, you know, how, whether this was bona fide or not, he seemed, um, whether he was trying to compensate in some way for his lack of education as a self-educated man, um, I, I, I don't know. Um, but what, I'll tell you one thing. I found him to be um, um, consistently interested in, in ideas. I think he fancied, um, and he wasn't alone, that in some sense the Soviet Union had already reached another plane and already left former people or past people behind. And they had entered this new realm already, as did many millions of his followers think that, like this. You, you can read uh, uh, Platonov's uh, novels and see how they left this behind. They, these people were just sort of other creatures wandering around aimlessly, bourgeois like us. And Stalin was pushing relentlessly ahead. I mean, if you look at what he, what he left when he died, um, I, you know, it's, we, have, we have the document. It's astounding to read what he left as, as it's documented by the guards eventually. Four or five pairs of boots, two tunics, four pairs of pants, the kind of thing really that a pauper or a dyed in the wool revolutionary would leave behind. And I think that's what he was. And whatever drove him, um, I understand why George Kennan uh, could reach the conclusions he did that Stalin was kind of a czar. Stalin joked about that. But he never made any of these claims about being a revolutionary to people he didn't want to hear it. He, he never said any of this to Stalin, uh, to, to FDR or the, the diplomats or the church or any of those. This was strictly for internal consumption. But everybody knew, everybody knew. And you know, if I were gonna recommend one book to get an insight on, on 
on, 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 the, on those times, it would, be, it, would, it would be Vasily Grossman's book. I mean, you, how can you possibly summarize this as a historian? We are lost for words, the depth and the breadth and, and the scope of the tragedy involving not just the Soviet Union, but others, others as well. How can you possibly understand this book, Everything Flows by Vasily Grossman, is just an unbelievable book. It's an unbelievable book. I, 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 I think if you, if you, if you want to just try to grasp what, what's, what's happened, uh, that would be a book. But it's, uh, it's one of those classics that, that will be read long after uh, history books um, are superseded. And uh, I still believe, I know uh, about the Carnegie Foundation findings uh, last Friday, uh, that there are uh, people who are holding on for varying reasons uh, to Stalin's legacy. They, and to some extent, have, uh, have um, uh, revived it. But I still think that, uh, that in the end, uh, wisdom, human common sense and decency uh, and other values like that will win out over this uh, curse of Stalin. This being said, thank you very much, and our session is concluded. Thank you.